toweringly tall and dark, preferably 6.4 feet, and at worst, chocolate complexion. An extremely handsome Bantu man with well-constructed muscles, a majestic walking style with a cool, confident, and courteous demeanor. Yes, indeed, he must be a sight to behold and to own. At most, he should be five years older than I am with a stable career. <laughs> Preferably, a lawyer or a financial controller. Neither a marketer nor a human resource man qualifies. Those ones are always broke. He should be cultured and stylish, and must be able to use the fork and knife with utmost ease. He must be romantic, and as a minimum, take me out once a week for dinner, <laughs> and buy me flowers. He should be fun and adventurous, so that we can travel and explore the world together. He must know and enjoy cooking. <laughs> because I expect him to surprise me once in a while with a homemade dinner or breakfast in bed. He must have a very strong relationship with God and must attend church every single Sunday so that he can draw me closer to God. <laughs> and most significantly, he must be an animal lover, especially cats. Because the memes tell us that real men love cats. <laughs> These are the qualities my future husband should be adorned with. And these are the quality Virginia quickly disregards as nonsensical and fantasies. <laughs> and she quickly asks, what about you? Are you as cultured? Do you have the money? Does your beauty meet the standards? And why can't you draw yourself closer to God instead? <laughs> if you ask me a couple of years back, I'll say Virginia is a dream killer and very old-fashioned. Virginia's choice at most is about 5.7 feet tall. Thankfully, he's chocolate and bantu. His career features nowhere on my wish list. But he loves animals. I don't have much information on what inspired Virginia's choice. But one thing I can confirm for sure is that much is to be admired from Virginia and Johnson's relationship. Growing up, I watched and observed how these two related to one another. And once in a while, I would copy their actions, which later my brother and I would replicate. In my naive being, I only thought Johnson and Virginia are the older version of my brother and I. It was impossible to imagine that these two could be from different mothers. The only way two people could live so harmoniously and in accord is only if they're brother and sister. These two are alibad. They woke up together and had breakfast together. They left for work together. In the evening, they had dinner together and chatted the evening away after dinner, 
and repeated this routine almost every single day. One outstanding aspect for me between the two is the amount of time they spend together. They are literally together, always. For instance, when Johnson wants to go for a haircut, he asks Virginia to take him. And that presents a perfect opportunity for a lunch date. Once in a while, you'll spot them at the hotels reminiscing of a dinner about how life was back then and how it is now. Probably laughing at how they had made plans to only have three children, yet the one standing in front of you now spoils the plan. <laughs> I have always thought that there is this solid and strong relationship that neither an earthquake nor a hurricane can break. However, in December 2013, on the 23rd, my mother was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. And she had her surgery the following day. This was an extremely trying moment for our family, but more so between Johnson and Virginia. As everyone was enjoying their Christmas and making merry, my mother was recovering from her surgery on constant supply of painkillers. And I sat beside her bed as we chatted this day that never seemed to be coming to an end. My father had traveled back to Embu the previous night after my mom had woken up from her sedation at 9 p.m. He had a Christmas sermon to deliver. At 11 a.m., my mother asks me to dial the number of a neighbor who helps her with house chores back at home. And she picked the phone and asked her to go home and prepare my father lunch, which he would eat after returning from church before making his way back to Nairobi. That triggered my mind to wonder that despite the pain and the medication she was under, she still was worried about what Johnson was going to eat. Fast forward. She was discharged and went home where we took care of her until September 2014 when she was stable and I had to return to Nairobi to continue with school. We did not have a house help because we couldn't find one. But Johnson woke up every single morning to prepare Virginia porridge. And he would go back to the bedroom to wake her up so that she could have her breakfast. He ensured that her medicines were taken on time. And he washed every single dirty dish on the sink. He finished his errands early so that he could return and prepare Virginia dinner. Not forgetting, before this situation, you'll never find him in the kitchen. He was literally present for her every single moment she needed him. This did not go unnoticed the magnitude of how, in sickness and in health, was still deeply tattooed in him, even after close to 40, four decades of them exchanging their vows. The illness changed some aspects of their life, but nothing about their love or friendship. They still have breakfast and dinner together. They still take each other to the barber and still have their dinner dates. Johnson still drives Virginia to the hospital for her appointments every single month without fail and without complaint. 
I have witnessed their life and love. I have observed and learned from them. They have defined to me what love feels like and what it looks like. And they have created the desire in me to experience their love. And yes, indeed, this is the kind of love I want to experience. It is no longer about the 6.4 feet with man who is dark with well-constructed muscles. Not anymore. But I want a man who will love unconditionally. One with whom the connection is deeply rooted. And one who will be present in sickness and in health. Because love has everything to do with it.